Professionalism and Communication by Dr. Gina Geis. Hello, my name is Gina Geis and I'm an attending neonatologist at Albany Medical Center and assistant professor of pediatrics at Albany Medical College. This module will address the topics of professionalism, the parent-physician relationship, communication, and the prenatal consult. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. We all know that communication is important in the field of medicine, but there are nuances in the field of neonatology that can make effective communication particularly important and challenging. Communication and professionalism are core concepts within bioethics, and we will address them here as they pertain to neonatology. We will identify the key competencies for effective communication. We will define the essential components of professionalism as outlined by the American Board of Pediatrics. We will look at the various ethical principles and how they apply to this area of focus. We will also delve a bit deeper into the prenatal consultation and examine how the written literature can guide us through this process. We will also look a bit into the parental perspective and identify which elements of communication they deem most important. Effective communication. So we can all agree that communication is important, but why? It's a part of everything we do in medicine. It is the most important and common procedure in medicine. The use of the word procedure is interesting as it applies that there's something performed when we communicate. We will get into this a little more later in the slides. Over time, there has been a transition from paternalism to joint decision making. Effective communication is essential to achieve this partnership. Even though we are jointly making these medical decisions, we still emphasize the importance of autonomy. Typically, we talk about patient autonomy, but in pediatrics, in most cases, it is the parent that acts as a surrogate for patient autonomy. We assign this role based upon the assumption that the parent has the best understanding of the best interests of their child. But what about provider autonomy? Provider autonomy states that the medical provider should be able to practice medicine as she or he deems appropriate. Effective communication helps us to uphold both patient and provider autonomy and promotes the achievement of shared goals of care. We know that communication influences both patient and provider experience. Patients report greater satisfaction with their healthcare experience when communication was effective. Also, the ability to effectively communicate enhances our satisfaction as providers and improves outcomes. Finally, we practice in an increasingly complex healthcare system. Effective communication is essential to navigate through these complexities, increase efficiency, and minimize burnout. Effective communication is responsive to the needs of the whole patient and family dynamic. It is essential to the patient-centered and family-centered care, the basic building block of the medical home concept, endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics as the cornerstone of care. You can see that with this definition, there's an emphasis on the patient perspective. In other words, to make communication effective, we must make this a bi-directional process. Communication is not only given, but received. There should be a flow back and forth. In 2008, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Committee on Bioethics released a technical report to guide communication with families and children. In this report, they identified three elements of effective physician-parent-child communication. The first is informativeness. This refers to the act of providing information with a focus on both the quality and quantity of information. The quality component has us focusing on the delivery of information. This is in where the skill lies. The second is interpersonal sensitivity. This emphasizes how our effective behaviors impact the other person. These behaviors reflect our level of interest in the other person. The third element is partnership building. This highlights the dynamic nature of communication and invites the parent to partner in this endeavor. So why are we spending so much time discussing something that is so ubiquitous and inherent in all that we do as physicians? Well, in 2008, the AAP and the Committee on Bioethics released a policy statement that addresses the needs of increased attention to this area. This statement reveals that communication is a skill that is teachable and therefore must be taught. There is a growing concern that there is a loss of empathy by medical providers. 
part of our lack of skill might be attributable to a lack of skilled mentors. The AEP proposed that one solution is a train-the-trainer model. In this model, non-physician mentors who are trained in communication, such as social workers, child life therapists, child psychologists, and members of the American Academy on Communication and Healthcare, can help physicians and faculty develop these skills. Components of professionalism. Professionalism has a strong presence in the field of bioethics and has been a defining feature in medicine dating back to Hippocrates. There have been many definitions of professionalism. Some central themes in this concept are that professionals have a focus on knowledge and education. One key component is that professionals self-govern, implying a great deal of responsibility to practice at a certain level. In 2007, the AAP and the Committee on Bioethics issued a technical report that outlined the ideal standards of behavior and professional practice for pediatricians. In this statement, they identified eight components of professionalism that were endorsed by the ABP as the most appropriate for teaching and evaluation. The first is honesty and integrity. This embodies the principles of fairness and the provider's ability to meet commitments to the patient and family. Reliability and responsibility represents an accountability to the patient and family and requires an acceptance of responsibility for errors made and addressing them with honesty and integrity. Respect for others involves treating all persons with respect and dignity, includes sensitivity and confidentiality when appropriate. Compassion and empathy is the ability to understand the children's and family members' reactions to pain, discomfort, or anxiety from their point of view. Self-improvement involves a commitment to lifelong learning and education. Self-awareness and knowledge of limits requires a level of maturity to recognize when a problem involves some knowledge or skill beyond the experience of the provider and charges them to ask for consultation or assistance in those situations. Communication and collaboration has us partner with patients' families to work cooperatively and communicate effectively as to achieve best patient care outcomes. Altruism and advocacy refers to an unselfish devotion to the welfare of others. This has the patient's well-being as the primary motivating factor for what we do as physicians. Application of Ethical Approaches The basic principles of bioethics can be applied to the element of communication, the parent-physician relationship, and prenatal consult, but with specific nuances that are important to address. The first is autonomy. We spoke a little about parents and providers as autonomous decision makers, but what about a newborn? What about an older child? Do they have autonomy? Should a fetus? We mentioned how we assume that parents make the best surrogates for decision-making for their children, but is this always the right assumption? We mentioned physician autonomy, which can be applied to the concept of professionalism. This concept of self-government promotes our autonomy, but this is obviously rich with complexities. And again, what if these two autonomous decisions are in conflict? Again, we emphasize the importance of effective communication as a tool for conflict resolution. We can also apply the principle of beneficence to these areas of focus. When we promote the good, are we talking about an overall well being? The neonatal population has an enormous potential for health years. How do we factor in this potential when we talk to parents about risks and benefits of treatment? Similarly, when we apply the principle of non maleficence, how do we determine what is an acceptable amount of harm? Is the goal to achieve survival, survival without morbidity? The NICHD Outcomes Estimator attempts to address this question for the extremely preterm population. They report statistical outcomes referring to percent survival, percent survival without significant morbidity, and percent survival without moderate morbidity. How do we utilize resources to partner with families and communicate effectively? We can also apply the principle of justice and distributive justice. Justice applies to fairness in treatment and refers to the individual, the patient. Distributive justice 
applies to issues such as resource allocation, healthcare dollars, and is more of a public health perspective. Feminist ethics has an interesting application here, particularly as we discuss the prenatal consult and decision-making in the setting of a maternal fetal dyad. Care ethics, or ethics of care, is another normative ethical theory, like consequentialism or deontology. Care ethics focuses on our dependence on one another and the dynamic nature of our coexistence. It has us factor in the context of a given situation to determine what is morally right. The situational thinking and importance on response can be applied to communication, relationship building between physician and parent, and the way we conduct a prenatal consult. Prenatal consultations. The prenatal consult is a perfect example of communication in neonatology put into action. Some indications for a prenatal consult may include preterm delivery, congenital malformations, concern for fetal or neonatal prognosis, need for further decision making, or whenever parents request. Goals and strategies of the prenatal consult should be clearly defined. They should meet the goals of both parents and physicians. They should be individualized to the situation, provide comprehensive information, use sensitive language, create a trusting relationship, provide a supportive environment, and above all else, it should benefit the patient. Important elements of communication. So if the goal is to benefit the patient, and in the field of neonatology, the patient and family, what can we learn from the literature to help us achieve this goal? A study by Mirton colleagues addressed this very question. In this study, parents were asked to prioritize the following areas as they evaluate the physician-parent communication. They ranked the most important quality as availability. They wanted to have their physician present. Next was honesty and comprehensiveness. How honest are they with the information that they're delivering and how understandable is it for the patient and family? The third, affect. The fourth, maintenance of full disclosure in preventing false hope. The next, avoidance of complex vocabulary and appropriate pacing of information delivery. And finally, avoidance of expressing contradictory information and negative body language. As you can see, there are many skills listed here that could be practiced through mentoring, workshops, and feedback sessions. So in conclusion, I hope that you will take away that effective communication is a skill. This skill can be taught and must be fostered. We've discussed how various ethical frameworks can be applied to these topics of professionalism, parent-physician relationship, communication, and prenatal consult. And finally, we must strive to achieve the standards of professionalism as outlined for pediatrics. I want to thank you for joining me today and welcome any questions or feedback you may have. Please feel free to contact me via email anytime. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.